This conference will now be recorded. My name is Richard Maliaco. I'm one of the forecasters here at NWS Glasgow. And I'm here with Virginia Rux, another one of our meteorologists. And together, we're glad that you could listen in for the next half an hour or so. We're going to take you through a Coco Raz training. Uh, and um, we're going to basically explain what the Coco Raz program is. It basically stands for the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. And essentially, they're weather observers that basically collect precipitation reports and send them in every day for us. And we're looking for new uh, observers all the time to help out with that effort. So if you're interested, uh, this training is for you. And also, if you're already an observer and you're just looking for a refresher of some sort, this is a great opportunity. So in the next few minutes here, Virginia and I will kind of take you through the training and how to get started. Um, so first things first, we have the uh, explanation of what Kokoraz is, basically a nonprofit grassroots organization. Volunteers are made up of all ages, uh, all kinds of backgrounds. You don't need to be a you know, weather or science expert to, to get involved. Um, <clears throat> and we just measure precipitation, things like rain, hail, and snow. Today, we're going to focus on kind of warm season reporting, so kind of just your rain and hail measurements. And then you'll want to check back with us once the fall comes around and we'll get involved in the how to take your snowfall measurements and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> once you guys are trained up and you get started, uh, our volunteers uh, only need a couple of things to really take the observations. You need a four inch diameter rain gauge uh, or <clears throat> some kind of ruler or yardstick. And there's a couple of ways that you can get a rain gauge on the Coco Raz website, which if we have time, we'll share that with you a little bit. Uh, you can <clears throat> go to uh, ambient weather or weather your way, which are links on the right hand side. Uh, those are a couple of places where you can find uh, the rain gauge. And we try to have everybody use the same equipment so that way we can compare apples to apples when we're looking at the information that, that comes in. <clears throat> so the web page is going to look something similar to this. <clears throat> and in the right hand side on the top, you'll see a join button. And that's where you'll want to go and enter your information. And it'll create a weather station specific to your location. And once that is done, then either Virginia or myself will then follow up with you. And we can answer any questions you have, help you get started, that kind of thing um, in terms of just sending in your report. So what we're going to go through is exactly how to take your measurements and also how to submit those reports here today. And uh, so get everything you need to know just to get started. So this is, if you're on the fence about joining, some of the reasons why we like our Kokoraz observers uh, as much as we do. Number one, precipitation is very variable. Uh, here in the summertime especially, you know with thunderstorms, you could get dumped on with an inch of rain in your backyard, but across the street, they didn't get it at all. They're wondering what thunderstorm. And <clears throat> so uh, sometimes we can't always see, using just traditional radar data and the like, where it rained and where it didn't. So your observations can help fill in the gap. So where the, that information is, um, <clears throat> that's where that information is helpful, where data sources are kind of few and far between uh, sometimes. In addition, especially in the wintertime, you have, of course, especially around here, you get that wind blown snow, all that drifting. And so um, sometimes the measurements that we get from other sources, they're not always the most reliable. So we get you, you guys to, to chime in with your observations. That helps us out a great amount. And of course, storm reports can save lives. If uh, you guys get a timely report into us, uh, we can include that information in our warning information that we're putting out. And of course, Kokoraz observations aren't just used by meteorologists with the Weather Service, but folks like insurance adjusters, mosquito control, those in education, and a whole host of others um, use the data. So this is just a really great way if, if you're interested in the weather or making it. It's a great way to make a difference in the community. Um, so going forward, we're going to talk about what we need to get started. And basically, it's a completed application form. Nowadays, that's all just done online. So when you click on that Join button, you fill out some information there. And uh, that's all you need to go there, some information about your location and that sort of thing. And then it's just a commitment. Get the best reliable data as you possibly can. 
Occasionally, you'll also get some Kokoraz emails. Some will be from the emails on your screen, as well as from Virginia and I. Sometimes we'll send some stuff out that's basically additional training materials or just fun little tidbits for you to pick up. Uh, and you know, if you want to make sure you get that, make sure you check your that, that spam filter now again and that sort of thing. Um, so once you get your training done, much like this one, and your station set up, this is what it'll look like, by the way. MTSH021 is an example of one that is in Plentywood, uh, uh, or near Plentywood. This one's a little northwest in Sheridan County. And you'll be able to log in with a unique username and password that's specific to you. Uh, so for the next section here, we're going to have Virginia take us through uh, exactly how to set up your equipment and, um, and and kind of take you through the next stages of the program and what it takes to get involved. So I'm going to share the kind of the screen with her in a moment and uh, make her a presenter here and she can take over the next section. Okay. I just want to make sure that you can see my screen okay? Absolutely. All right. I'm going to have to fast forward to the section. So in this section, I'd like to share with you the best placement of your rain gauge and how to properly measure rainfall and hailstones. Um, after I'm done with this section, Rich will cover information on what you need to report your observations um, in section three. So let's begin. We understand that not everyone has the most ideal location and setup. That's okay. First and foremost, though, the worst locations for your, for your new rain gauge is to keep it in the box or putting it in an obvious location where the gauge is practically useless, such as under the, the gutter downspout. Less obvious locations that you wouldn't want your gauge is right by trees, buildings, and tall structures. And while the deck may be convenient, it's still too close to the house. Sorry, let me hide that. Also, be mindful of sloped areas, sprinklers that could alter your data, and interferences by pets and other animals with your gauge. Finally, consider avoiding areas that can artificially increase or decrease your catch when windy, such as a solid fence. Now that we've covered the least desirable places to put your rain gauge, where's the most ideal location? Notice any similarities in these images? They're in a wide open area away from tall structures and can remain largely undisturbed. The gauge sits slightly higher than the top of a beveled post several feet off the ground. But not everybody has the ideal location and not all hope is lost. Here are some ideas to strive for. When, you're, when you stand in your yard or your field, have a good look around. If you have an open area, Strive for a distance two times as far away from those objects as they are high. For those who live in neighborhoods and developed areas, strive for a location just as far away from obstacles as they are tall. Here's an example of a person's yard with a couple of trees near the house. A gauge can be placed equidistant from each tree or obstacle. Once you've decided on a location, how high should the range, how high should your rain gauge go? If you manage to have an open area, keep it low to the ground, maybe about two feet, and that will help reduce any effects from wind near the surface. On the other hand, for developed locations and neighborhoods, a gauge placed a little higher, about five feet off the ground, will reduce the effects of nearby objects and improve rain catch. Now that you've established the location and placement for your rain gauge, you're all set. But be sure that the gauge sits level and consider having the top of the post it's attached to beveled rather than flat. This could help with reducing splashback into the gauge and 
for those similar reasons, um, having the opening a few inches above the post will help with that splashback. So congratulations, you're all set to collect data. Good data is collected at the same time every day. For Kokoraz, we'd like observers to collect their data and report about 7 a.m., but anywhere between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. is fine. For myself, when I, when I work, I try to align my collection time with when I'm leaving the, the house for the day or when I'm coming back from an overnight shift. I just make that a, a part of my routine. All right, so reading your rain gauge is pretty simple. But here are a few reminders that will make the difference in excellent data collection as accuracy and consistency are important. Very often, your gauge will read zero. It is just as important to report zero to know when it didn't rain as much as knowing when it did. As long as it's not morning dew, a drop or two in the gauge is considered a trace and is reported as a single capital T. A trace is also less than one one hundredth. The small ticks along the tube are hundredths. Notice the ten ticks between each tenth. This image is showing four hundredths or 0 0.04 inch. You'll notice that as water fills the tube, surface ten tension between the liquid and the sides of the tube will cause the surface to curve like a lens. This lens or this curve is called the meniscus. You want to measure the bottom of the meniscus for the appropriate measurement. Notice that this tube is sitting at about 0.5 inch or 5 tenths, not 5 hundredths or 0 0.05. The inner tube measures up to one inch So as you can see, decimals are essential. Four inches is different than four tenths and is also different from four hundredths. So what happens if you get a soaking rain over an inch? Fortunately, these gauges can catch up to 11 inches. When rain falls over an inch, it'll automatically spill into the outer tube. Measure your first inch from the inner tube then, using the funnel over an empty inner tube, carefully pour the water from your outer tube into the inner tube and continue to add your measurements until the gauge is empty. For example, you have your first inch, sorry. For example, you have your first inch and then you continue to fill it three more times from the inner tube to the outer tube. You have your first inch, then you have 97 hundredths, and then 88 hundredths, and then 92 hundredths, which when you total them all up, equals 3.77 inches. Another occurrence that happens in the summertime is hail. Here's where your ruler comes in handy. While hail is falling, stay safe by staying indoors. You can estimate the size from a distance. And then once the storm has completely passed, collect some of the storm, the stones, sorry, collect some of the stones and measure with a ruler. As soon as you can, submit your report online to Kokoraz. Your information can go directly to the National Weather Service and may even help with deciding to issue a severe thunderstorm warning. The online entry form will also allow you to add any extra details you may like to add about your hail observations. So now, so now I'll pass it over back to Rich and he will explain how to navigate the kokoraz.org website and how to report your observations and what you can do next if you're interested in becoming an observer. All right, and I think everybody can 
see my screen hopefully at this point. So uh, as Virginia said, uh, when you, the important thing when it comes to reporting your observations, when it comes to hail, I just we can't underscore enough to uh, that uh, you want to make sure that it's safe to do so. You don't want to necessarily go outside when it's dumping on you. You might wait till that storm passes when it's safe to do so. And uh, the other thing I want to emphasize is don't feel like, you know, if, if we're telling you 5, 6, 7 a.m. in that window to send your reports it doesn't work for you, say that the only time of day is in the evenings or maybe you're only available some mornings. Uh, Kokora is pretty flexible and um, we're willing to take information from you um, no matter what works for you. I think that having a report at a different time of day is better than not having information about a site at all. Uh, and uh, there's also things called multi-day reports for when you're on travel or maybe you had a few days that you were just really busy and you couldn't report that morning. And so we'll show you kind of some of those different reporting forms uh, coming up here in this section. <clears throat> so uh, let me see. First things first, here's again the, the, what the Kokoraz website uh, will look like <clears throat> and you'll log in on the upper right hand side with your unique username and password and then the first form the one you'll use most of the time is that daily precipitation report it looks a lot like this where you'll enter the date the time usually it'll again be that 7 8 9 a.m time frame you put in the precip watch the decimal place uh, and <clears throat> then some observation notes some extra information about the report maybe you want to put something about a wind gust that occurred or some damage that occurred or something um, so uh, and again measurement to the nearest hundred so here is an example of some extra information so they talked about how the, the, the precip was very brief but it occurred very intensely around eight o'clock and they talked about some tree branches broken so something to be aware of and then once you get that in there you hit submit and you're good to go. Uh, you can also take a look at how your reports stack up to those around you. <clears throat> Everything is color coordinated so you can kind of see um, zero in that gray shading and then greens give you that one inch amount plus and so on and so forth. If you click on the state you get a close up of just Montana and you can even get even a closer shot of uh, Sheridan County and as an example where you can see this is exactly what we're talking about when you pick a couple of people sent in their zeros and then other places did pick up a trace and you can kind of see how your location stacked up to those around you and where the precip fell and where it didn't and if that person didn't send their zeros in for example they're thinking to themselves well it didn't rain here so why do I want to put in the time to send that information well maybe everybody would look at the data we got thinking that well most people must have picked up a light amount of rain that maybe a trace or a hundredth or something and you wouldn't really know that there were places that didn't get anything at all so that information can be really incredibly important so there's other types of reports hail report is important uh, so that form will look a little something like this you, again you put the date the time uh, some information about the smallest and largest and average stones how long it lasted and that sort of thing uh, intense precipitation report uh, is another form that you may occasionally use if something happened that's particularly unusual you want to make note of. And then your monthly zeros. So you can go in and submit your monthly zeros in a form that looks like this. You just kind of check off the days that nothing occurred and then again hit submit. So Multi-day accumulation. This is the one again where say, well, you know, I want to go and be a part of Cocoa Raz, but I'm really not sure it's for me. I travel a lot. Uh, but this is an example of how it can it can work with your schedule. If you do travel and you're gone for several days, or maybe you're just having a situation where that particular week things are busy, uh, you can put in a report, just mention the first day of the accumulation period the date that you emptied the gauge, the time that you emptied the gauge, and then you put in the amount over that multiple day period, and then we know how much fell at your site over that time frame. Oh, so that can still be very useful to us. And then again, when you submit your information, you can go and look at how your information stacked up to those around you by date. <clears throat> and uh, while you're thinking about whether or not to join, uh, we do have a couple of common questions that people ask. So again, one is, do I have to be home every single day? And, and again, we prefer that 7 to 9 a.m. in the morning. But again, report when you're able to. If the only time of day is in the evening, but you still want to report your information, go ahead and do that. 
and you can take advantage of those multi-day reports. Uh, if you don't have a good place to put your gauge, once you set up your station number and you hit that join button, Virginia and I will get an email that you've signed up with the program. We'll reach out to you if you have any questions um, at that time. And you can feel free to share with us a picture of your site, maybe your yard or where you're thinking about putting the rain gauge if you're not sure exactly what a good spot might look like. And we can kind of help you out. And in truth, most people don't have that perfect location, so we just encourage you to do the best you can. Um, <clears throat> we already talked a little bit about morning dew. That's not a type of precipitation, but that's a good thing to include in a comments section. And how long do you want to report to Cocoa Ross? Well, ideally, we hope that if you get involved, you stay with us for at least a season. But the more information you provide for us, um, the better it uh, becomes. It almost becomes a mini climatology. You know, for those who have participated for many years, you kind of get a sense of what's normal, what the extremes are. And um, some of our observers that have been with us for many years kind of uh, can, can kind of talk about that as well, um, just how valuable that data set becomes over time. So that's kind of wrapping things up today. I do want to show you again really quickly on the website here uh, if that comes up on your screen. So this is what it, that join button looks like. If you hit the join button, you click on your location, and then um, you'll get the form, then you fill out some information, and you hit that submit. And that's when, again, Virginia and I will get some information on your site and your contact info, and we'll um, answer any questions you have. But I also wanted to point out on the right-hand side here, if you scroll down a little ways, this weather your way and this ambient weather, those are the locations where you can go and uh, find a four-inch rain gauge, an official Cocoras rain gauge. So you can be, uh, again, sending your observations and providing apples to apples so we're all using the same thing, if that makes sense. So we want to thank everybody uh, for your time here today um, and for listening in. And we certainly hope that you'll uh, consider becoming a Cocoras observer. If you're already an observer, we thank you very much. Uh, your, again, your information is very helpful to all of us and a whole number of others, not just meteorologists. So we can't thank you enough. And uh, if you guys have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out to us.